Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there. Hello and welcome to Capes on the Couch, where comics get counseling. I'm Anthony Sitko. And I'm Dr. Issues. This is issue number 95, Killer Croc, as requested by Ariel, who loves her bat family and villains. This has been an interesting one to, to research on. Killer Croc was never one of the rogues gallery that I knew much about. And uh, outside of the Suicide Squad movie, and uh, admittedly being the person that leans a little more towards the Marvel side, I never read a whole lot of Batman. So I didn't know that much of Killer Croc's personality. And now that I've read some of the stuff that he's in, he's one of my more favorite members of the rogues gallery, I will say that. Good for you. I'm glad that you've expanded your horizons a little bit with that. That's the thing that I love about doing this show is, is just getting to read stuff that I wouldn't have ordinarily otherwise read. And then it gives me a better understanding of not just the character that I'm researching, but also any additional characters. Because reading the whole Suicide Squad story, I understand Harley a little bit better and I, I get a, a different vibe on her personality. But in any case, this week's podcast shout out comic book keepers it's kind of a newer show i think they only have like a handful of episodes uh but chris and lance review a character or a topic each episode sounds familiar um but they're more focused on the the background and the history of the character they're not delving so much into the mental health analyses as of yet but uh, you can check them out on their website thegeeklygrind.com and last, I will just remind you, uh, thanks to everybody who's voted so far for the award show. You can go to capesonthecouch.live slash nominees and go to the link there and submit your votes for the various nominations for a number of categories, as well as the AMA, the mailbag that we'll be doing for the 100th episode. So you've got some time on that, but I uh, just wanted to send that to you as a reminder. So let's jump right into the sewers and let's tackle Killer Croc created by Jerry Conway and Gene Colan in Detective Comics number 523 February 1983 that's another thing i discovered about researching this character he's not that old killer croc is actually younger than you and i that actually makes it a little more terrifying in my opinion but yeah you're right how so well most of the time when we think of characters like this i Grew up reading some things regarding Killer Croc, and for some reason, I think anything related to Batman, I think, is from like the 1960s and and beyond. So, the idea that his character hasn't been around that long, like, wow, how on earth did I get so intensely attached to him? I think that says something about the character itself. Fair point. Yeah, Killer Croc does carry kind of that air of like a maybe a, a silver age, like you'd figured you know, maybe a 60s or 50s type of character, mm -hmm. but we would be wrong. So Waylon Jones, his real name, he was born with lizard-like features. And basically in the, the original, I think this is more, I think this version of his origin exists both pre post crisis and then new 52 rebirth, etc. cetera. Uh, his parents died. And so he was raised by his abusive alcoholic aunt. And so as he got a little older, he killed her and then became a criminal in Gotham. And then as a result, he incurs the wrath of Batman. And so they tangle numerous times. And then after Infinite Crisis, he got isolated for months after being trapped under rubble. He was believed to be dead. He was not, in fact, dead, but he was basically living off of just eating rats, being trapped in the sewer for months on end, which left him with hallucinations, 
and a variety of mental problems. Then he has several battles with Bane, who always defeats him. Typically, at least breaks one of his arms, and he ends up in Arkham. So in the uh, New 52, he is Roy Harper's alcoholism sponsor. That's a left turn I did not see coming at all. Yep. I'm fairly certain we didn't mention that during our Roy Harper episode. Nope. Which is up for nominations for, I believe, best episode overall and uh, best DC episode. So go, go vote. Um, so in Arkham, he befriended a woman named Sybil with multiple personalities. Stop. Stop. Uh, listen, I'm, I'm just I, I saying. Swear, I swear to you, I will walk off this podcast. If no, you, you won't. Okay, I won't. But, but it was just like I was reading. It was like, oh, her name is Sybil and she has multiple personalities. Really? Mm. Really? That's, that's mm. the, the genius level writing that we're dealing with here. How original. Anyway, he befriends Sybil and he finds her daughter, Olive, when he gets out because he had promised Sybil that if anything happened to her, he was going to watch over Olive. And so this is really where we start to see another side to Killer Croc. Yeah. Pre-New 52, he was basically just muscle. He was brute, brute force. Yeah. New 52 and Rebirth, we really start to see a shift in his characterization. Yeah, absolutely. Abs just to jump in, I mean, it, it's nice to see that he really has that that peaceful side to himself and, and starts to branch off his personality because of Olive. Get it? Because Olive... Yeah, we, we got it. We got uh, it. Yeah, okay. You're not even waiting for the end of the episode for the puns. Don't have to. Fair enough. So in DC Rebirth, he joins the Suicide Squad, which I think was probably this comic was written because of the movie. It was definitely, you know, we talk about this all the time with Marvel, but it certainly I think happened here with DC that the Suicide Squad, and all of a sudden, oh, look, it's Enchantress and Rick Flag and Killer Croc and Captain Boomerang. And so he ends up having a romance with June Moon, the human side of the Enchantress, because she saw him as more than just a monster. And reading, I didn't read the entire run, but I read a good portion of it. And the one thing that I liked was that she said to him at one point, you make me feel safe. And it was particularly entertaining, this one issue where they're just out and about. They're just, they're on a date and they're just going around and they're just enjoying each other's company and everybody is losing their mind as he's walking by. And they're like, there's this woman, she's like, won't somebody shoot him? Uh. And they're like, please just, just shoot. Him. Look, he's a giant crocodile. Mm. Get him out of here. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, Oh, you're so beautiful. Oh, I love you. Oh, and they're just like gazing in each other's eyes and everybody else around them is losing their shit. It's absolutely hilarious. Yep. So then he is part of uh, Harley Quinn's crew for a period. And then he runs a hotel for redeemed villains and monsters trying to give folks a, a second chance. So he doesn't, based on both the the time in which he was created and just the number of appearances. He's he's never really been given a lot to do as far as a member of the rogues gallery or as part of the books. He's always part of an ensemble. He's never really had, there's no, at least in my research, there's not a definitive killer croc story that you're like, oh yeah, that's, you know, like the Joker or, you know, several members of, Batman's rogues gallery have like that definitive story that they can point to. Killer Croc doesn't have those. What he does have is, I think, a series of progressively more humanizing stories that compel you and draw you in on the character, which I think in a way is almost better because you can say, oh, just, just read all of this stuff and start from here and you'll build up to the point that you understand his development and so on and so forth versus, yeah, you want to read this one story and then forget everything else because everything else can't compare to, mm -hmm. you know, this one particular story. We see that all the time with, with comic books, but I digress. So the issues, the first thing is 
We, we referenced it in the very beginning of his background. He's got the history of abuse due to his appearance, and this literally started in childhood, that his aunt was an alcoholic, and she called him lizard boy, this, that, and the other. And due to the nature of his disease, it started off where he was, and part of this is the way he was drawn, et cetera, is he was humanoid with just a couple of scales, but then as the disease, whatever, progressed, it yeah. just, he became more and more reptilian and then, you know, mm -hmm. grew bigger and less mm -hmm. human-like and the teeth and the whole shebang. So regardless, he has been dealing with abuse and people being, as I just said, afraid of him and freaking out based on his appearance, regardless of what he, who he is as a person. And this is in no way timely to current events at all that people are just judging folks based on their appearance. It's not like we have anything to draw from in the news on a given daily basis, but yeah. I digress. Yeah. As you so eloquently put it, uh, he's dealt with a lot all the way from birth, basically. And there are two ways I was thinking about this. One is the idea that someone does get abuse purely based on their situation. Uh, there's the reason why the term redheaded stepchild has come into play. And it's unfortunate, but it can it doesn't have to be physical for Croc it is, but it, it could be just about any circumstance where you are a child that should have the love that everyone deserves and instead you don't get it from any of the sources you would expect you don't get it from parents you don't get it from the people around you within your own social sphere of influence you don't get it from society at large it's almost universal that you're going to have a difficult life from the very start and i'm not even talking socioeconomics or any of the other factors that can play into this but it's very difficult to say to someone straight faced, just deal with it or you can, you know, you can overcome or you can have things better when you know from the beginning that that wasn't true. That's wasn't realistic. So all the interactions that you have, let's be honest, there's a huge chance that you're going to be dealing with someone that has a lot of. Uh, a lot of emotions that they may or may not have dealt with because dealing with those emotions in the moment may have led to a lack of survival. In other words, if a child starts screaming and they are not wanted, what usually happens to that child? I'm not trying to get too morbid here, but I am being realistic. The point is none of the results are good. So you may learn to shut your mouth. Because that's how you live another day. You may learn to, in theory, develop something else that you wouldn't have otherwise. Croc, in his case, he's got a lot of muscle behind it. And, and it develops quickly. Obviously not as a little baby, but still. It was enough that he was able to change his circumstance. And I'm not advocating what he did at all. But he felt he was absolutely desperate. So. All of those things put together, you end up with a lot of repression, suppression, the difference being one is intentional and one is not, the idea that you just push these things to the side. Or if it's something that people are going to shove in your face every day, as they would with Croc, and there are arcs where he's a part of quote unquote freak shows. I hate using that term, but it's the truth. Uh, well, that's what they're called in universe. Right. So he goes all in on it and just says, if that's really the way things are going to be, then I'm going to act out that stereotype and it's going to garner some level of attention. It's going to garner a certain level of respect. I mean, it's, it's more fear than genuine respect, but still another survival thing. And so your life becomes about survival. It doesn't become about enjoyment. It doesn't become about fulfillment. It's all about how do you make it to the next day? And after a certain period of time of doing nothing but that, then that's all you see. 
So I'm not saying that it's a setup for automatic failure. It is a setup for automatic uh, change in expectations. And when you have the same likelihood that this is going to continue for the rest of your life or foreseeable future, then you have no reason to change your survival technique. And as much as it is, as much as it can be an indictment on the person to not have adaptation, I think it's tenfold an indictment on society at large if we're not able to recognize things that are wrong that lead to this in the first place. And I'm really doing my best not to make this about everything going on right now, because I feel like if I do that, then this becomes a time capsule, which it can be in media, I get. But this is something that's happened centuries ago. This is something that's happening currently. And I can't predict the future, but I have the strong suspicion that it's something in maybe a different way that is going to continue to happen for the next generations. And thankfully, at least having this type of medium, we're able to talk about it in a more sophisticated way. But I do have the fear that depending on how we handle situations with the next generation, that we may end up actually regressing in this. I, I hope not, but it does something. It is something that scares me. So, you know, Killer Croc, I, I didn't, ex I'll be blunt, I didn't expect to get into something that deep, but. Honestly, even reading, like rereading some of this stuff, it, it it has been there from the start. So got to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And he he is a black man. I know it's not mm -hmm. referenced much in the comics because his appearance is that of a giant crocodile. But underneath it all, he is still a black man. And so you wonder if that carries some undercurrent as well with how he feels and how he's perceiving things and to some extent how he's being treated again even subconsciously perhaps that uh that he's carrying that with him to say again nothing of the obvious physical appearance of looking like a giant crocodile so the next thing that that I want to talk about is the instance of isolation. And this is, it's an older storyline, but it still, I think, resonates with him to some extent. Um, it's something that he carries through the, the years is the isolation. And he did not handle that well, which is to say, by the way, it's not an indictment against him. He was left for dead. And he was isolated and subsided on nothing but rats. And as we have seen numerous times and has been shown in studies, isolation is incredibly damaging to a person's psyche. We collectively are social creatures. We need interactions with others to survive and to thrive. And we need those interactions to be positive. Even if they're negative, at least you have some sort of a connection, to have nothing, to have no connections to anyone, left him with hallucinations. And I would say, if not fully justifiable, at least an understandable lashing out at everyone, at mankind and Gotham City for abandoning him. So and if you want to talk a little bit about isolation and what that does to people, I do know that, uh, you know, minor spoiler alert, I know we'll be discussing with the Mental Health Avengers coming up very soon and the effect of mental health or lack thereof in the prison system. And so solitary confinement, uh, I'm sure will come up at some point in the discussion. So try, try not to save. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm try, sure Try to say can. something for that discussion. Uh, but. You already hinted at something there that's germane to the topic. If you don't receive feedback from the world around you, then your brain has an amazing capacity to fill in the gaps. So that's where the hallucinating can come in, even if a person doesn't have a predisposed psychotic illness. So 
That's not very surprising. And that sort of thing could set in even after a few days of sleep deprivation. It doesn't take nearly as much as we would think. It doesn't have to be that dramatic as being lost in in a desolate, destroyed area. Although our experience in our lifetimes with something like 9-11 and searching for survivors and all the other tragedies that have happened throughout the course of history these things have happened, but it doesn't even have to be that. It can be the simple idea that whether it's self-imposed, like a teenager that that walks out and is now trying to find their way in the world, whether it was a, a positive or negative situation at home, or unfortunate circumstances where the person no longer has the resources that they used to. Maybe they lost their job and they were in their own city away from their typical family unit. And Now they don't have any way to contact anyone. It's a little less likely now with social media, but still it happens. So there are plenty of ways that people can be isolated and it doesn't have to go this comic book route. But either way, it's the reciprocity, the idea that when I say something or do something, I'm going to get a reaction from someone and it's going to be either good or bad or maybe indifferent, but still it is something. It's a stimulus. Without that stimulus, then you don't know how to make your next move. You don't know uh, what the end game is supposed to be. Even if you have your own goals for for what's supposed to happen in your life, it's kind of tough to see how you're gauging it. It's just natural for us to say, okay, am I winning, quote unquote? Like, what what am I doing? Uh, So uh, there's so many things that we would consider to be positives. Like, okay, well, what about meditation? I'm sure you can meditate by yourself. Like, well, well, yes, but if you have even just one mantra that you do and then there's no impetus to either change it or or heaven forbid it wanders in a way that isn't productive, how would you know? At some point, you, you have to, quote unquote, test these things. If you're not testing yourself, then you're you're not going to really succeed in the long run. Uh, This is the type of thing that I I see commonly uh, in my job, in the inpatient unit, where even when people do ultimately start getting those interactions back, their skills have atrophied in terms of just being able to recognize other people's emotions, being able to engage in basic conversations. It's fascinating just how much that, that dissolves if not used. It's like any other muscle. Like if you're if you're not using it, it really goes away. People would be really surprised about this. It's not like it, it's just something you could turn on and off. So I'm not surprised that someone like Croc would have those types of reactions because once again, I know we talk about them as quote unquote separate issues, but you go back to the first one. You already know the type of reaction that you had before. Now imagine someone that doesn't know anything about you that that's their very first reaction to you after you haven't had any interaction with anyone. That's not going to bring up some good vibes, to say the least. Definitely. And what I, I think it's interesting, and I didn't see it going this way when we started this, but when you talk about the atrophy of skills, I question how much of that is happening today with everything that we're dealing with in the pandemic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure from your professional perspective, you're seeing that, but it's not something that I had really considered until you just mentioned this. But the idea that our social skills have potentially atrophied and, and there's a lot to be said as to whether or not the existence and the proliferation of social media and the Internet has led to the, the decrease in social skills already, but now to the point that we are almost exclusively forced to rely on digital interactions in lieu of interpersonal interactions, I think that there is a strong possibility that we are seeing a a, a sea change in society and not one for the better. I, I think six months of spending the majority of your time by yourself or, you know, at home and only really getting to interact with people in very limited digital only circumstances. I mean, for kids that don't get to go to school, I mean, that's a whole thing in and of itself. That's a a separate discussion we could 
get into completely off topic, but just the notion that we are currently living in this isolation and we are seeing it on the daily. So I really don't think that this is anything that is going to come as much of a surprise to anybody, but just again, the idea that it leaves an impact on you to not have these interactions with people, you know, on a, on a regular basis. The one thing that always bothered me, and this is like kind of like a tangent, but this social distancing, social distancing, no, physical distancing. Yeah. Let's, Correct. let's call it, let's Correct. call it physical distancing. We do not want people yeah. being socially distant because that leads to a breakdown of society. And the fact that that is the nomenclature that has taken root, everybody's, oh, we have to socially, social distance, social distance. No, do not socially distance yourself from people. That leads to problems. If you have to physically distance yourself from them, you know, that creates its own set of issues, but do not socially distance yourself. Do not socially isolate yourself from people, please. Uh, you know, that's just a little beg and plead from, from your friendly host here at Capes on the Couch. And again, I could get into a whole other soapbox side tangent topic, but I'm going to try and rein it back in and discuss the third issue here, his relationship with June, which is something that I thought was so just wonderfully endearing reading it in the suicide squad the way that it just it seemed very natural mm -hmm. it seemed organic to both mm -hmm. of the characters you know yeah. and, and enchantress is certainly one that i'm sure we'll get to at some point in the future ariel will probably add her after <laughs> after she runs out of robins and immediate bat family uh characters to to get into i'm sure enchantress will show up at some point and and we'll talk about the relationship from from June's uh, side when we get there. But the idea that he finally has an opportunity to feel love and worth as a person, as an entity, and not just oh, you're useful because you're big and strong. You're useful because you're powerful. It there's no utility here. It's who he is. It's June and Waylon as people. And as far as I can tell, maybe outside of the, the friendship that he had with Sybil, this is the first relationship that he has. And it gives him so much hope. And it gives him just, uh, as I said, and I'm using this term both tongue in cheek and legitimately, it humanizes him. Mm hmm. And I just think it's it yeah. just wonderfully done. Yeah. Yeah. That's the that's the thing that really makes him the type of character you can root for. Because what happens often in comics is especially someone like Killer Croc, who in theory could have been the true stereotypical always evil destroying killing et cetera et cetera into this this person that you don't have to know her reasons although she does say them you don't have to know another person's reasons for why they love someone you really don't it's none of your business as a matter of fact one of the things that i got from instagram a long time ago and uh, i oh boy i'm i'm saying that you know, very specifically, because I don't check Instagram a lot, is what other people think of me is none of my business. I didn't even know you yeah. had an Instagram. I don't. I don't. But my wife does. And Touché. once in a while, once in a while, she'll scroll through things and, you know, I may be reading over her shoulder. No, I'm not stalking her. But my point is, I saw that once and I, it, it caught me off guard. Only because I feel like that's the opposite of what I've always done in my life. Like, no, I want to know what everybody thinks at every time because I just want all, as much information as I can get. And I know we were just talking about the feedback that you get from the world. Well, Croc has gotten a lot of feedback and it's all negative. And then there are times where he gets zero feedback, which we already established is not good. So can we can we at some point just tip the scale just a little bit? And I think what I I enjoy most about it is how powerful it is for just one person. Sometimes we think of this as a, as a quantitative thing. And, and it, for many situations, it is. If you have overwhelmingly negative feedback 
and very little positive feedback, then in theory, the negative feedback should always win. And yet, when you get a level of intimacy, that positive feedback can overshadow an incredible amount of negative feedback. That can be a powerful thing, both in a good way and a bad way. It can be manipulative if the person wants it to be. But in this case, though, I, I at least the way I read it, because I, I did read this a while ago, uh, I, I thought it was genuine. And when I see that, I, I love the fact that it speaks to a very positive part of human nature. Sometimes we are willing to take a chance and throw away all of the data that we've been processing for all the years that we've been in existence. And if we allow ourselves to be vulnerable in a certain way, then we can, I don't want to say wipe the slate clean because all the, all the things that Croc experienced, it doesn't go away, but it at least allows it to be processed in a different way than he ever would have before. It doesn't just allow for him to have different emotions than he's experienced at a level that he never has before. It allows him to think that if this can happen with one person, can it happen with many? And I'm not talking polyamorism. I'm saying just the idea that you can have positive interactions with others around you because you had this one. And sometimes that's all you need. Just the idea of one person taking that chance that no one else has and saying that I'm going to look at you from a perspective that no one else has been willing to do, or very few have been willing to do. And that alone is enough to keep some people going. I've seen this firsthand with many patients. So I don't want to make this like a separate call to action, but, but the idea is if you have someone in your life where other people say, I have no idea how that person is still around in your life or, or, or whatever, and provided that they're not doing harm to you, if you can let that person know that I'm thinking about you, I, I, I just want to let you know that. I don't know if, you know if things are still the same or I, I don't know what's going on. It's not just whether or not you've maintained distance with them or, or whatever. It's more along the lines of, you know that person in your life that doesn't have many other people, but they have you. Just taking that little bit of time, it doesn't have to be romantic. It doesn't have to be an ex. It doesn't have to be a former best friend. It, um, it doesn't have to be anything dramatic. Just letting that person know that you're still there in the background can make a huge difference. So if you have the opportunity, and like I said, if it's not a harm to you, because I know relationships change over time, then just taking that little tweet or that little text message or anything, phone call, old-fashioned letter. Sometimes that's even more powerful nowadays because it's so uncommon. It can make a huge difference. So... I'll I'll leave it on such a high note because just even talking about this really gives me a warm feeling. So you're suggesting we should all text our exes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for making sure that my words are bastardized in the most <laughs> cynical way possible. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. But no, I in all sincerity, I do think it's important and I do think that it's, it's, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this, but the idea that we can express our feelings and, and one of the things that we talk about on the show all the time is the destigmatization of mental health and also just some of the, the discussions around feelings. It should be completely normal to tell your friends and the people that you care about that you love them. And that I really try and do my best, at least in my life, and I know you're well aware of this, that you should normalize telling people that you love them, if, if you truly love them, if, if you're sincere about it, because love is not just romantic love. And I point back to our religion class in high school where we we're taught about all the various Greek words for love and the notion of agape. Yes. That caring about the welfare and well-being of others is love in just as legitimate a way as eros, as the whole notion of romantic love, etc. And I think if we can normalize that and we tell 
people. I love you. And normalize saying it and normalize hearing it. And we put that love out there. Again, this is the pie in the sky optimist in me speaking, but we're going to see some changes. You know, we're going to see a, a positivity because knowing that you're loved makes yeah. you a better person. Yeah. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback on that just a little bit, because I think sometimes what happens to people is we get paralysis by analysis where we wonder, how do I say it? Or what is it that I need to say? And, and, and I think our language is just as adequate as it was in the time of Shakespeare. It, it that's not nearly as important. Words matter and, and, and meaning matters. That's true. But, uh, even if you're you're one of those people that no matter how you say something, it comes across as an insult, people can usually tell when you're being genuine with it. So I'm going to say the dumbest thing that I think I could say to someone like Croc, like, you know, like, come here, you know, come here, you, you green scaly SOB, you know, like, wait, what? Well, like, don't call him that. That's really stupid. But no, the point is, even you could hear it in my voice, the idea like, no, 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 I'm here because I want to, you know. I want to pal around with you. I want to actually enjoy your company. That's the part that if that comes through, all the other stuff that you just messed up with your words, it can still be worked out. Like, well, why would you say that to me? Like, no, no, no. I want, I want to, I just want to spend time with you, dude. Oh, that's what you meant. It, it's, it's those moments that allow for people to clarify their words. Because I think what happens a lot is we all go by the immediate word and we don't know any of the intention behind it, and we don't even look for the intention behind it because the person that originally said it isn't able to give that context, which is where the whole social media thing comes in again, because text is way different than podcasts. It's also why I prefer a podcast like this, because you can tell the inflection in my voice. You can tell the tone that I'm saying. And there is a very great example of this in radio versus written form, which is the statement, I never said that you were stupid. If you've ever taken that in its written form without italics, but then italicize each word, think about how many meanings can be applied to that. I never said you were stupid. Imply right. somebody I else never did. said. I never said you yep. were stupid. Yep. I never said you were stupid. I never said I never you said were stupid. You were stupid. I never said you yep. were stupid. I never said you were stupid. Exactly. So you just you just went through all of them, but. That's the point with this. Croc never had to worry about that with June because it didn't matter how she said it. It was the inflection and, and the emotion behind what she said and the genuine nature of them enjoying their time together, ignoring the rest of the world. When you can have that connection with a person, then it really does help your defenses, even when you're being just pummeled by everything else. And my favorite part of their relationship was June Moon is a graphic designer who was trying to get some freelance work. And so she's going out to all of these big firms and trying to get a portfolio so that she can go work in New York City. And Croc is sitting there by himself and he goes, but if you get your dreams, what happens to mine? You know, or something along those lines. And he's, he's crying. Because he realizes that he he loves her so much that he wants her to be happy, even if that happiness means leaving him. And at that point, I just really wanted to just give him a big hug. And then, uh, spoiler alert, she gets rejected by a whole by basically every design firm in the city, completely loses her mind, proceeds to turn into the enchantress to the point that she's gonna destroy everybody because she's so pissed off. And he and again, just a wonderful, heartwarming act goes to talk to someone else at one of these design firms and said, look at this work. Why would you reject her? And it's partially, I'm sure, because of the nature of her work and also partially because he may have felt threatened by, you know, a giant nine foot crocodile. But he goes, uh, you know, actually, we do kind of like your work and we, we would like you to, to come work with us. Please, please don't destroy the city. But I just thought it was so sweet that that was how he chose to address it, not, you know, because he, he understood what was causing her to be upset in the first place. And 
he was addressing the underlying cause. He wasn't like, oh, no, I need to fight the enchantress or no, I need to do this and that is, oh, she's upset about this. Let me fix this. And then everything else gets better. Which, you know, tip to guys out there, if if you find out that your significant other or just anybody really, but, you know, speaking as two men, we're usually the ones who screw up. If you, if you find out that your wife, girlfriend, fiance, whatever is pissed off, try and figure out what it is that you did wrong to start her pissed off and fix that. Don't just go, oh, I'm just going to buy you flowers. That's just surface dressing. You want to hit the source. You want to hit the underlying symptoms. Just, you know, tip from a guy who's been married for a few years, not nearly as long as Doc has, but I digress. <laughs> preach, man, preach. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, see, we're not just talking about mental health. We're also giving out relationship advice. This is a multifaceted podcast. So we're going to take a short break, plug a couple of shows, and we come back again into treatment. Stay tuned. Do you love true crime, history, and mysterious happenings? Every week on The Cult of Domesticity, a guest and I discuss a different historical happening, a true crime story, or whatever strikes our fancy. Join me, Courtney, every Thursday to hear some fascinating tales from some fascinating people wherever you listen to podcasts. Hi, this is Jimmy from the podcast Talk Me Into. The show where my co-host Dan, Jeff, and I talk each other, and maybe even you, into liking what we like. Here's a little taste of our show. I need another episode. Whoa! My God! I was not expecting this! It claps, too. It does. It do clap. It's a proper bop. Jeff and Jimmy, did I talk you into liking... Spoilers. No. (laughs) If you feel so inclined, you can listen to our show every Tuesday. Find us in every podcasting app and follow us on Twitter at TalkMeInto. Hi, I'm Meredith Finch, and you're listening to Capes on the Couch. And we're back in universe treatment for Killer Croc. Try not to get killed in the first place. Um, But no, really, it's... I'll meet him in the sewer. Because there aren't many non-Batman people or non- similarly abled people like Croc that are willing to do that. And I think just that show of genuine interest uh, would would really at least get him thinking before, you know, invading his space and splashing my throat. So that's my first step. And then from there, it it would be just totally disarming. And, and not not the Batman disarming once again. It's It's just the idea of like, Hey, bro, what's up? Like, just being as as genuine to the moment as possible. And more importantly, I'm willing to acknowledge the fear. Because what I think happens sometimes is, as, as providers, we, are lear- we learn early on, you're not supposed to have too much of an emotional reaction to your patients. But what I think happens with people who are so emotionally distant out of their own survival, if you don't show some vulnerability yourself, then they they basically cut right through the BS. So if a person has a rap sheet and they look intimidating, I will say like, dude, you, you're pretty swole. What's, you know, how, how are we going to, you know, I, I, you know, I, you could take me. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to handle that. So it just lets them know, like, I'm not even trying to, I'm harmless. I'm not, I'm not trying to hurt. So that's the first layer. And then from there, because I doubt someone like Croc is going to want to immediately dive into a lot of super emotional stuff. I think it's more like, I don't want to say like bromance, but it's more like, what, what do I, what do I have to do? Like, what, what is it that you want right now? You know, what's the instant gratification thing? Because that survival instinct is much more about what do I need to do now as opposed to what's going to help me in the future. So I have to reach that next. Um, If it's as simple as you want some food other than rats. eh, All right. You know, I'll get that for you. You know, just just really trying to ingratiate. And I don't want to make it sound like I'm sucking up. That's not what I'm that's not what I'm about. I'm saying this is no different than what I would do if someone 
in theory, were outside of my office if they were homeless and I happen to see them there. You know, I may not give them direct money, especially if they have a substance problem, but I would gladly say, you know what? There's a diner or there's a restaurant right across the street. If you want, I'll happily go up to the register and I'll buy you, you know, I'll buy you a meal. How's that sound? You know, like just just the actual genuine idea of human contact in a way where I'm doing this. And also very clearly, like I'm not expecting something in response. I think that's something that has been missing from mental health treatment for a long time. In a comic universe, I feel like I can do that in a romanticized way and it would be well received. If I do that in our current world, a lot of times it gets looked at as um, being too soft or, or just, I'll just say like people have other ideas about it. And I know this is a little off base, but that's just how I feel. Someone like Croc, if he's going to rip me apart, he would have done it from the start. If he hasn't done it already, then that means I'm, I'm, I'm getting somewhere. So like I said, dive into the sewer. Don't mind the stink. All right. All right. So out of universe treatment then. Um... Oh, I, oh, I've got this. Oh, I've got this okay. built up. All right. Okay. Person that basically has been abused by family does have some sort of background that would lead to major disadvantages in life. Uh, it may or may not have turned as, you know, included with Roy Harper's sponsorship, the idea that it may have turned to substances at some point. Clearly have something underlying that they need to address, but are very scared to. Uh, in Croc's case, he went to Arkham. In my case, I'm going to say people that have been either in jail or inpatient psych or long-term psychiatric hospitals or a combination of all of it. I actually have a particular patient in my head right now. And I'm going to tell you, he is one of the most fun patients that I've dealt with on multiple occasions. He has done a lot of damage. He has caused a lot of uh, a lot of hurt in other people's lives, but he also has shown the biggest heart in the most random times. And it's because whenever we deal with him, we recognize him as a human being and we make sure that even when we are doing things such as temporarily restraining because he's acting out or needing medication or just yelling and we're just standing around and we are just letting him vent his head off, screaming and all of that. And when he's done, we just simply say, what do you need right now? We're here for you. And each time we, we greet him the next day with a warm smile and making sure that he ate, making sure that he's getting enough sleep, asking where he's going to go next, who he's staying with. If the game is on that night, making sure that we have the unit quiet enough, not just for him, but for anybody else that wants to watch, but also even knowing who his favorite teams are. And, you know, once in a while, just doing those little gestures that remind him of his humanity, having him say to us, you treat me more like family than my family does. Wow. That's the type of thing that we'll see in these types of cases that are quote unquote recidivists that don't quote unquote get better. It's and, and actually it creates a problem for us because what ends up happening is when things don't go well in the outside world, that patient comes back to us because that's where they feel the most comfortable. Unfortunately, there's a level of institutionalization that I'm not advocating for. What I'm saying is, what can we take from our system when it's working that well and see how we can help adapt it to the outside and trying to focus on that? So we've had those discussions, especially with the mental health Avengers, and I know we're going to get into that way more specifically. But what are some of the adaptations then that we're using that other people either aren't vested in or just aren't seeing because he presents a different way to others? What is it that we're missing? And how do we bridge that gap? That's much more of the focus of treatment after the first or second hospitalization, to be honest with you. It's not a matter of just, oh, let's switch the medication. If a person has stopped taking medication, of course, let's reinstitute it if it's necessary. But much more important once that part is taken care of is, okay, what are the other factors, the other social determinants, oh, there's that hot topic, uh, that are really influencing this person coming back into the hospital or going back into jail or, or, or whatever, and how do we adapt that? And, and to be honest, there are many things that 
the patient has to take responsibility for if they are re- rejecting those offers of different circumstances, if not improved circumstances, then eh, then they're going to get the same results. Nothing changes if nothing changes. But when people are getting declined from programs based on their history and family says they can't handle the person anymore and despite the fact that the person has charges and and is looking potentially at jail time they also say well the person is out on bail or or they're on probation and we don't want to violate them and the housing situation doesn't get improved all of the things that in theory should be lining up aren't then that handcuffs us and that's the disappointing part to this story. So the idea that we have to bridge that gap somehow and continue to work to bridge that gap and becoming pests to the outside agencies often, making frequent phone calls with our social work team, et cetera, et cetera. That's really the part of treatment that I don't think we talk about nearly as much, but I think is just as important. So that's the focus of treatment above and beyond the individual things that we do. And I just want to shed some light on that because often people say, well, if they just took their medication, okay, well, that's a part of it. Or if they just stayed away from so-and-so, well, that may be true. But if they feel like there's nothing else in the world, then they're going to end up doing the exact same thing. So hopefully for all the people that can relate to Killer Croc, I hope you recognize that, yeah, we do care. And yeah, we are here for you. We just don't want to be the only ones that are there for you. Very powerful words. And uh, I did not see it going that way. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I I do feel very strongly about this. Oh, I can tell. Um, And so can the listeners. (laughs) So I guess the next step is to wrap all of this up into a bow and see what happens when we get Killer Croc on Dr. Issues' couch. Hello, Waylon. I'm Dr. Issues. Hmm. <laughs> oh, so many pants crept with that. You did good, though. You have no idea how bad my nightmares are going to be now. Sorry. Not sorry. <laughs> I had some intel that you weren't a bad guy. That's, that's not exactly endearing. Dear man, slow down. I don't hate you. I don't like you yet. I don't know you. Then give me a chance, and I'll give you a chance. I passed your test, so you'll have to pass mine. I don't do tests. Point taken. Then just answer a question. What's your best quality? I'm strong. I agree. But not necessarily in the way you think. I could rip this place apart in ten seconds. You in one. No, I mean, you're a survivor. Have to. I'm a freak. Have been all my life. Well, uh, I I wouldn't say it like that. Yeah, you screamed, just like everyone else. Point well taken. Uh, I apologize if I hurt you. Can't hurt me. I'm strong. Ironically, now I think you are describing what I wanted to talk about. What types of emotional barriers have you put up to deal with being shunned? Don't talk, show teeth, eat a lot. So how do you let those barriers down? Don't. Not to people like you. Like me? Nosy. Think I'm stupid. Have all the answers. Swing and a miss. I'll let you talk, you have your own agency, and nobody has answers besides you. Blunt. Better. Don't be soft like Arkham nerds. Arkham professionals are soft? Really? (laughs) Just the eggheads. Guards dumber than me, but don't know it. Oh, you know how to read people. Okay, street smart. But who do you trust with that? Nobody. Uh, I don't buy that. No. Ma. D. Nope. Still don't buy it. (laughs) Her. Her who? June. Why? She's nice. So are a lot of people. To me, not many. You believe her? Yeah. Why? 
proved it. Fair enough. How do I prove it? What? No, 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 not not like her, not like that kind of love, but but uh, trust. I, you know, how do I prove you can trust me? Fight when you have to. Well, I'm, I'm not a fighter. Now you don't get it. Oh, oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. Confidential. No guards. No information to police. No names, locations, dates. Willing to testify in court about how you're doing. Nothing but the truth if subpoenaed only. Your end is you don't hurt anybody. Deal. That, that seemed a lot easier than it should have been. You, you realize that means I'm going to ask a lot of stuff about the pain you've been through and the suffering that like led to all that rage, right? Don't tell anyone. Got it? That's the point. <clears throat> Maybe deal. And no growling. <sighs> Don't push it. Sorry. Sorry. How about a warning before growling? Better. Then I look forward to working with you. <clears throat> we'll see how this goes. Do you need a new change of pants, though? No, nah, I was already wearing brown. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, recommended reading for Killer Croc is Suicide Squad. I think it's volume five. It's it's the, the Rebirth edition. It's like 2016. I think Rob Williams is the, the writer. There's a couple of different artists on it, uh, I believe. But uh, it's the team that's largely centered around the movie version. There's no Diablo in it, but, you know, you've got Rick Flagg and Killer Croc and Katana, Harley Quinn, the Enchantress. It's corporate synergy, but the book is good. The book is better than the movie, and that's a hot take, and we're not going to get into that. So we haven't done one of these in a while. A review read, uh, The Villains Demand. Also check them out. They're an awesome podcast. Uh, they left us this review on Podchaser. If you want a unique insight into your favorite characters, then subscribe and tune in. As a huge comic book reader, this is an interesting perspective on heroes, villains, and everyone in between. A channel with a massive YouTube reach should reach out and make sure it's based on these. It's easily a million dollar idea. And someone hit Marvel up because Dr. Issues needs to set up shop with Night Nurse. Wow. Wow. Not just the review, but actually pointing out that we are grossly under monetizing this. <laughs> I mean, you know, listen, if uh, if we want to get uh, who is that guy that uh, I'm, a, I'm a Marvel, I'm a DC. It's just some random guy. It's just some random guy. I mean, we'll talk to him about. Uh, oh, my about, gosh. Oh, that would be amazing. That would that be would amazing. Be, oh. Oh, wow. Yeah. That goes on. That goes on the dream list. Okay, that that would be pretty sweet. And Tyler says, uh, "Thank you guys for everything. Love the content, and we love you, Tyler. Sincerely, we yep. say that we were just talking about it. We normalize saying I love you. I don't know you, but I love you. We we want you to get the help that you need that yep. you want, um, yep. because yep. you, you want to get better. You want to become a better version of yourself. I don't understand why anybody would want to stop that or get in your way, but we we're behind you. So so next episode's coming up." Uh, we're throwing this one into the mix because I wasn't 100 percent certain where it was fitting into the schedule, but I believe our next episode will be Mental Health Avengers. We're getting the gang back together again. It's been quite some time since our last roundup, but uh, we're going to be discussing mental health and the prison system because you know, random topic thrown, you know, pulled from a hat in no way, shape, or form relevant to anything that's happening in the news these days. And then we will get back to our regular list. Uh, so Black Adam and Hank McCoy. Um, so want to remind you again, get those votes in capes on the couch dot live slash nominees for the 100th episode of Word Show. Send us your AMAs, your questions, and reminder that all of our episodes are on capes on the couch dot live. And uh, if you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or Stitcher, and we'll read it on the show like we did with the Villains Demand earlier. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Capes on the Couch. And, uh, and YouTube. Well, we're, we're on YouTube. We're, we don't have one of those fancy shortened uh, channel names yet. But we'll talk to, it's just some random guy. Maybe we'll hook up with him. <laughs> <laughs> God willing. Uh, Doc, 
Well, if you only knew the superficial things about the character, you may have thought he was just an evil and bruising jerk, but I really hope we prove that's just a crock. I would almost say that gets nominated, but it's a little late, but maybe that'll get nominated for the the 200th episode. If we're still doing this in another 100 episodes, we shall see. We should be so lucky. For Doc Issues, I'm Anthony Sitko. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there. I'll take this moment to, uh, I guess, address, uh, say hi to Tyler, uh, watching us on Facebook right now. Tyler, first off, thank you for watching and thank you for listening. So glad to know that you're uh, joining us. To the point of your follow-up, I can certainly understand the notion that uh, insurance is not always your friend. And uh, I would say then that perhaps you have a couple of options. I would say contact the insurance company because they may have a list of providers on hand that will accept the insurance. I don't know which particular company you have, who the insurer is, but I'm certain that they would potentially have a list of providers that would be accepting of new clients. And again, I don't know where you live. I don't know what your your current situation is. So this is all just sort of speculation you know, off the cuff thinking, but contact the insurance company and see if they have a list available. If cost is that much of an issue, then perhaps there are other resources available. And I'm sure when Doc gets off the phone, we can, we can have, you know, that sort of discussion uh, in terms of what is out there to, to assist. Um, I'm, I'm certain that he would know much better than I, given that this is kind of what he does for a living. I've been looking into Talkspace myself just because uh, I was looking for a therapist pre-COVID. And then obviously all this lockdown stuff happened and it's weighed on me mentally being home for six months. I'm an extrovert. And so this is being stuck at home and really only getting to see my wife and, and son and some family members has been has been hitting me hard. So Talkspace is something that I've been looking into. So again, I I haven't priced that out yet. I don't know all the particulars, but it's something that I'm I'm looking into because I don't know that my insurance company will do telehealth, uh, et cetera, things of of that nature. Um, I think Doc is is back. Uh, I've been having a conversation with uh, Tyler uh, one of our listeners mm-hmm. who, who posted on Facebook, okay. um, he said, I finally tried reaching out for a month to help, but nobody around accepts insurance. Uh, I have oh. one of the best insurances available. And I know this is something yeah. that we discussed last, um, oh. the last time we were talking to the Month Health Avengers. We were discussing yeah. the whole um, notion of, you know, availability of providers and the notion yeah. of insurance companies. And I mean, you know, this is one of the things we were talking about, single health, single, single payer. payer system. Yeah. So my suggestion was, uh, while you, mm-hmm. while I was waiting mm-hmm. for you to come back, my suggestion was contact your insurance company and they probably have a list of providers in the area who would accept the insurance. Yeah. But I said, if that yeah. is not a viable option as well, you know, I don't know mm-hmm. what the options are um, in terms of mm-hmm. low cost. And I don't want it to be a situation right. where, you know, you're getting whatever you can because mm-hmm. it's free. Obviously, you know, we want right, you to right, get right. Uh, quality, quality care, but I don't know if you right. have and whatever ethical restrictions you have in terms of what you can recommend yeah Yeah. so mm, depending on the circumstances and depending on location uh if you go online for your state your state either has a mental health um, division or mental health department uh, but above and beyond that they more than likely have a crisis hotline what you need to do is you need to make sure um don't lie to them but if you're not suicidal, make it clear that you're not suicidal. Make it clear that you're not looking for hospitalization, but what you are looking for is uh, resources for an outpatient 
service. Outpatient, either, I'll, I'll be honest, in terms of what may be available through insurance companies, either an outpatient clinic or outpatient program. This is my way of saying get your foot in the door because it's not one size fits all. And once you are connected or you're able to make phone calls for initial intakes, then you can start <clears> to specialize <throat> from there. I've noticed in my experience, and mind you, my experience is limited to the state of New Jersey, that although programs may not be open for uh, in-person visits, many more are doing video and telephone calls, and it allows for flexibility. And many of them, if they, I hope and pray, if they are state funded, then they have more options in terms of being able to connect with someone. Is that a guarantee? No. but. It's much better than uh, just simply waiting uh, because obviously if people aren't taking insurance then their expectation would be either on a sliding scale or simply you save up the money and you pay for your sessions or, or whatever, you know, what have you. Um, that is a way to shortcut the system because um, crisis teams have to respond to the calls that they get. And it is not a, it's not an insult to them if you're not in, quote unquote, the classic crisis, that's fine. Don't wait till you're in a classic crisis, actually. It's the opposite, because usually they'll be able to direct you to the more local services that are available to you. Because to be honest with you, I know that a lot of places don't update their websites. They don't update uh, their their phone lists. Even the insurance companies aren't always up to date on their own phone lists. But I think Anthony is absolutely correct. The first step is contacting your insurance company itself. Uh, and then also your state's local crisis line. And this is why I said that, you know, I was coming up with everything as best I could, but I knew that Doc was obviously going to have a much more comprehensive answer because this is what he does. 